Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, more Ukrainians under Russian bombardment as more of their country becomes a battlefield. Emergency, air emergency in the city. The war expands, millions flee, and grieving mothers bury their sons. While diplomats warn, we have serious concerns that Russia may be planning to use chemical or biological agents against the Ukrainian people. Also tonight. <laughs> After 10 years in a Saudi prison, Rafe Badawi is free. The relief and uncertainty for his family here. Plus. It's kind of like a nonstop stress for two years. Two years in a pandemic have brought moments of despair, hardship, but also hope. You told us about your most meaningful pandemic moments. We were all just uh, giddy and euphoric that day. This is The National. There are ominous new signs tonight that Russia's 16-day war against Ukraine could be entering a new phase with new targets and possibly new dangerous tactics. But amid calls for Western intervention today, the U.S. President Joe Biden was blunt on why NATO troops must not get directly involved. Don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say. That's called World War III. Tonight, the Russian encirclement of Kyiv continues. New satellite images showing Russian military units moving closer, unleashing heavy artillery barrages. This image shows a fire raging at an international airport just outside the city. While that vice tightens, Russian forces are now broadening the scope of the war, driving to capture a major strategic city in the east and launching missile strikes on two others in the west. Chris Brown begins our coverage tonight in Lviv. The burning remnants of what Ukraine says used to be a shoe factory in Dnipro is one of Russia's latest targets. It's state terrorism, said a Ukrainian officer. One person was killed, but it could have been much worse as three missiles hit near homes and a kindergarten as well. In Mariupol, surrounded and cut off from food and water, the mayor told local media that Russian bombing has killed more than 1,500 people in the city. There are no casualty figures for Ukraine's military, but its losses may be heavy too. In Lviv Friday, there were funerals, with three wooden coffins and three families saying anguished goodbyes to their fathers, brothers, husbands and sons. One mother caressed her son's casket. When the lid was removed from another, the soldier's wife stroked his cheek and held his hand for the last time. How they died, where or what the circumstances were is not something anyone would discuss. The mother said her son Andrei Stefanishin was killed on the second day of the war. <laughs> Unspeakable regret, longing, heartache, she told CBC News. It's very difficult for me. <laughs> Sensing perhaps after two weeks the fatigue and despair of his nation, President Vladimir Zelensky went outside in the Kiev sunshine. We still need time, we still need patience, wisdom and energy to reach the victory together, he said, imploring Ukrainians to push even harder. For the first time in a week, air raid sirens sounded in Lviv, as Russia now appears to be striking even deeper into the country. Earlier in the day, missiles likely fired from Belarus hit two military targets 130 kilometers from the city, including in Lutsk. And Ukraine's military says it believes Russian troops near Kyiv are taking up new positions, possibly for an imminent assault on the capital. There are fears that Russia could deliberately cause an explosion at a nuclear power station and blame it on Ukraine or use a chemical or biological weapon and again blame it on Ukraine. Such false flag tactics Russia used over and over again in Syria and Western officials fear could try here. Chris Brown, CBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. And today, before the United Nations Security Council, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN accused Russia of those false flag tactics after the Russian ambassador claimed Ukraine was developing biological weapons under the supervision of the United States. 
As Chris Reyes reports, many think Russia's accusations actually hint at their own plans. We discovered a truly shocking fact of emergency cleanup by the Kiev regime. For almost 20 minutes, Russia's ambassador to the UN laid out an elaborate charge that Ukraine, funded by the U.S., ran an extensive bioweapons program, fortifying disease like the plague, with plans to spread it around Europe using birds and bats. There was a network consisting of at least 30 biological laboratories in which very dangerous biological experiments are being conducted. Western allies on the council were quick to shut down the charge. Today the world is watching Russia do exactly what we warned it would. Russia is attempting to use the Security Council to legitimize disinformation and deceive people to justify President Putin's war of choice. Let me put it diplomatically. They are utter nonsense. The U.S. and Ukraine double down, explaining that the country's public health lab system breaks no international laws and operates in the open. The U.N. official at the meeting confirmed. The United Nations is not aware of any biological weapons programs. Russia's accusations should worry the world, said President Zelensky. If you want to know Russia's plans, he said, look at what Russia accuses others of. President Biden issued a clear warning. Uh, Russia would pay a severe price if they use chemicals. One UN analyst says today's Security Council meeting signals a turning point as Russia uses its powerful and permanent seat on the council to push its own narrative. I think we're seeing the start of a new phase of UN diplomacy. Out of the 15 member council, only China firmly stood by Russia. The concerns raised by Russia should be properly addressed. It's a call rejected by most of the council. The lies that you're hearing today is beneath this council. One more sign that on the world's most powerful diplomatic stage, dialogue is becoming more impossible by the day. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Now let's turn back to the situation on the ground. As Chris Brown showed us a few moments ago, the Russians are now broadening their attacks, which may indicate a shift in strategy. Let's start with the drive to capture Ukraine's fourth largest city, Dnipro. Some U.S. military experts say taking it could cut the country in half and let Russia send forces along the Dnipro River Valley to attack the capital. Now to the west, where Russian missile strikes have targeted airfields near the cities of Lusk, and ivano frankivsk the goal analysts say to cut off much needed western aid and now from the north another possible threat belarus's state media reporting that belarus will receive weapons from russia agreed on during a meeting between the leaders of both countries today ukraine has already accused russia of staging a ukrainian airstrike against belarus to try to bring that country into the war well, for some analysis, let's turn to Walter Dorn, a professor of defense studies at the Royal Military College of Canada and the Canadian Forces College. And, and Walter, these changes that we saw on that map, is this a, a change in Russian strategy? I think that Kiev may, is the main objective still. But the Russian advance from the north is really stalled. They're facing fierce resistance. So they've got to bring in forces from other directions, from the east and from the south. And um, that's why we're seeing a lot of emphasis on Dnipro, because that's a, a major point for movement along the river and from the east. You know, I keep waiting for, or wonder if we're going to suddenly see much quicker advances by the Russians. Uh, we haven't so far. Uh, what's your sense of that? I think the Ukrainians are just putting up such stiff resistance. They have these anti-aircraft and anti-tank missiles that are proving to be very effective. And the Russians are just frankly um, caught off guard. They thought that it would be uh, much easier and now they're facing a really determined effort on the behalf, behalf of the Ukrainians. Now we have Russia's allegations that the United States is making chemical and biological weapons in Ukraine, uh, something that the US absolutely denies. What do you make of, of the allegations? I think it's r ridiculous. Uh, there's no basis for that, and it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense at all. But it is also alarming. If this is um, a false flag, a early warning that the Russia might be using chemical weapons itself, we should pay really a lot of attention to that and perhaps start equipping the Ukrainian forces with the appropriate equipment like gas masks and other things. All right. Walter Dorn, thank you very much.
Sure. Good to be with you. The U.S. and its allies are escalating economic pressure on Russia over the invasion of Ukraine. Putin must pay the price. Each of our nations is going to take steps to deny most favored nation status to Russia. That move would allow G7 and EU nations to bring higher tariffs to a range of Russian goods. Biden also announced today a ban on Russian seafood, vodka and diamonds. Ottawa revoked Russia's trade status last week and imposed a 35 percent tariff on imports from Russia. Also today. I can announce five uh, further individuals to be sanctioned, including Roman Abramovich. The assets of more oligarchs are being frozen in the case of Abramovich. That includes his 28 percent stake in the British-based steel company Evraz, which has a plant in Regina. It is one of the city's biggest employers, but Prime Minister Trudeau says the move won't affect the factory's 1,700 workers. Ukraine's president says more than 7,100 people fled four cities today via humanitarian corridors. For many, the goal is to escape the country. Millions already have. More than 175,000 are now in neighboring Slovakia. As David Common shows us, the conflict is forcing changes in that country as well. As one of Europe's smaller states, Slovakia may have sat in the shadow of the continent's power brokers, but geography has forced it now to the main stage. Tens of thousands have escaped Ukraine's horrors to Slovakia, including Katya, daughter Vika and father Mikhail, now heading to Dusseldorf because help is available there. Even one month ago, I thought military conflict was impossible, she says. We can barely believe what's happening now. Meanwhile, Slovakians themselves are panic buying pills to protect against radiation leaks. It all started when the Russians took Chernobyl, says Andrei Sukel of the Slovakian Association of Pharmacists. There was news about radiation escaping from the plant, and people got scared. And so, in small labs, they are now making more of those potassium iodide tablets in case Russian attacks cripple any of Ukraine's 15 nuclear reactors. Across Europe, soldiers are suddenly much busier, dealing not just with a massive refugee crisis, but deploying forces as part of NATO's efforts to ensure the conflict doesn't widen. European leaders are meeting, trying to kick their Russian oil dependence. Until that happens, whenever that is, frightful escapes will continue. Evacuees helped by foreign governments, but volunteers too, including Ivana and Danka. I hope whenever we are trying to send someone to train, we just pray that they will make it, you know. Uh, to their to their destination because a it's a long, them. long uh, journey. A lot, a lot of people with a lot of children. Lives deeply disrupted. Families split apart across a continent. David Common, CBC News, Kosice, Slovakia. YouTube has blocked channels associated with Russian state media. The company says the decision is based on its policy of barring content that denies or minimizes violent events. Also offline in Russia today, Instagram, after its parent company, Meta, said it would temporarily allow some posts calling for violence against Russian soldiers in the context of the invasion. Let's turn now to a major development in a high-profile human rights case that's brought deep relief at last to a family in Quebec. After 10 years in a Saudi prison, today the blogger Raif Badawi was released. Rafi Bujikanian brings us the reaction and concerns over what might happen next. <laughs> Every Friday for a decade, loud demands here for Raif Badawi's freedom. Enfin. Oh my God. But today, <laughs> his wife says she can't find the words. Her husband released at last after 10 years in a Saudi prison. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've woken up in the morning with a smile, she says. In 2012, Badawi was jailed in Saudi Arabia after he criticized religious figures and promoted liberal values of Islam online. His sentence included a thousand lashes. He received 50 in a public square. That sparked widespread outrage, the United Nations calling it cruel and inhuman. After that, he was not lashed again, though he did serve the full time. 
His daughter, now 18, says she can't wait to see him, but that reunion is uncertain. Another condition Badawi faces, a 10-year travel ban upon release. As far as organizations like Lawyers Without Borders, we will continue the campaign, we will continue to have a close watch on this, and we hope uh, this part of the sentence is not applied. Activists say the federal government should also step in. There's still a lot of other uh, places where Canada can meet and discuss with Saudi Arabia. Uh, the United Nations being one, but there's plenty of other places uh, to discuss. Badawi's wife has Canadian citizenship. He doesn't, though Parliament did unanimously pass a motion asking Ottawa to grant it to him, a move pushed by the Bloc Québécois. But the government has not gone ahead with it yet. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeted today that officials are now working to seek clarity on the conditions of Badawi's release, while his family and friends say they'll keep fighting until he's here. Rafi Bujikan, Young CBC News, Ottawa. The Queen will not attend the annual Commonwealth service at Westminster Abbey on Monday. Buckingham Palace says that Prince Charles will represent the Queen and that she'll continue with other planned engagements, including in-person audiences. The 95-year-old has had a few health scares recently, including a bout of COVID. There's good news tonight about the Canadian economy. After a tough start to the year under Omicron, the job market came roaring back in February. 337,000 new jobs were added. That's nearly triple what some economists predicted pushing the unemployment rate down to 5.5 percent. It hasn't been that low since before the pandemic. Tonight, Jacqueline Hansen looks at what's driving the growth and why wages are going up too. At Canada's busiest airport on the Friday before March break, it's the busiest day since the pandemic began. A sign travel, tourism and hospitality is finally starting to take off. We're actively recalling flight attendants, uh, cabin crew personnel, our pilots, our airport agents, contact center. Each domestic traveler a potential paying customer at restaurants and hotels across the country. Bookings at this Toronto hotel are still weighed down, but they are hiring to get ready for more guests. Our advertising 20 job positions. Hotels and restaurants accounted for most of the job gains last month as the latest COVID restrictions were lifted. But the sector still has 200,000 fewer jobs than before the pandemic. Here, it's not for a lack of trying. If we look for five em employees for less housekeeping, we may be lucky to get one right now. Competition for workers is heating up across sectors, and average wages are beginning to reflect that, up 3% compared to last year. While that still falls short of the rising cost of living, at some companies, wages are going up much more. Salaries are, are certainly high. They're probably 30 to 40% higher than they were two years ago. While the service sector led the surge in new positions last month, the construction industry was also strong, adding more than 30,000 jobs, surpassing its pre-pandemic employment level for the first time. We're really struggling with finding talent. We're really working within the schools to try and bring talent here, but with the busiest construction industry ever in Canada, it's a real challenge. With such strong demand for workers, economists say wages could climb even higher. That's good news for anyone looking for a job, but perhaps not for consumers who may have to pay even higher prices as a result. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, today marks the two-year anniversary of the WHO declaring COVID-19 a global pandemic. For many, it has been a difficult time. New data showing most Canadians feel their mental health has suffered. And as Christine Birak reports, the pandemic exposed cracks in how our country deals with that. Like many, Mona El Rafi's trying to stay positive. But it's not easy. It's not easy. She's feeling the weight of repeatedly shutting down her consignment store, juggling tight finances while caring for three kids. It's kind of like um, a non-stop stress for two years. She's not alone. A new Angus Reid Institute survey in partnership with the CBC reveals half of Canadians say their mental health has worsened over the past two years. Women under 55 in particular, over 60% say they're doing worse now than when the pandemic began. 
24-7 crisis support appeal. The volume of calls coming into some crisis lines in Ontario is up 30%. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And the callers are changing. They are in experiencing distress because of someone in their family or in their a loved one is experiencing some level of crisis, uh, either due to mental health or addiction reasons. Those who once offered support now need it, but the system is at a breaking point. Recent data shows 17 percent of Canadians who felt they needed help with their mental health during the pandemic didn't get it. In Alberta, it's even higher. Many people probably thought, oh, it is like going to the doctor. I'll just call someone and get some help. And then when they actually tried to do that, they realized that they couldn't afford it. Universal health care doesn't cover mental health. Privately, therapy costs up to $250 per hour. Otherwise, patients are sitting on wait lists for up to six months. And ultimately what that wraps up to is the notion that we all need universal mental health care. We've treated mental health as a poor cousin. I think it's critical that we know that there is help there. The federal government is offering up billions of dollars to support mental health. Experts insist that money needs to reach Canadians who are struggling and fast, emphasizing this pandemic has created a crisis, but it's also an opportunity to build a better system. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. With the Omicron wave receding, many provinces are beginning to lift mask mandates. But for some people, it's happening too quickly. We're trying to keep each other safe, and I feel like this is one layer of protection, and by removing it, it's, it's too soon. Coming up, our panel of doctors answers questions on the minds of many of you. And two years ago today, our lives were turned upside down. COVID was a huge wake-up call in terms of that the world can flip on a dime. Coming up, the pictures that tell the stories of life in the pandemic. And a little later. Everyone had their phones, laptops, and people were searching. How some Winnipeg high school students helped a Canadian man fleeing the war in Ukraine. We're back in two. CBC News has been looking into the rising costs of just about everything in Canada. And housing, whether you rent or buy, is a big one. And we know it's been a major issue in Canada's cities, but you may be surprised to hear that even those living in rural areas are feeling the squeeze. Cameron McIntosh shows us some tenants who have been priced out. Winkler, Manitoba just keeps growing. Its population nearly doubling over 20 years. Signs of booming manufacturing and farm industries are everywhere. Demand for rental accommodation has driven the vacancy rate below 2%. It's why Isaac Wall, his wife and eight kids are crammed into this small three-bedroom rental. In the future, it would be better having more room. A Mennonite farmer from Paraguay, he moved to Canada to be close to his family. His rent here eats up 40% of his income. You pay hydro bill, you pay phone bill, and you pay your rent. That's pretty much asking me for all the money I make. It's not that new rentals aren't being built, it's just that demand keeps outpacing supply and Winkler's not the only community in rural Manitoba seeing it. In this province, 40% of rural renters are considered to be in core housing need. That means rental units either cost more than 30% of household income, are too small for the number of residents, or are in poor condition. 23% of rural Manitoba renters fail two of those criteria. We know that there's more work that needs to be done. Manitoba's Families Minister says a rent assist program is helping. There's also a 10-year plan for more affordable housing. 40% of those new units are in uh, municipalities outside the city of Winnipeg. New Canadians make up a lot of the demand. Some could be buying if banks recognized foreign credit ratings. Steve Reynolds helps settle newcomers. That would relieve some of the pressure off the rental market for sure. Mortgage is the way that I want to go. For Andrew Robinson, a recent arrival from Jamaica, rent here is 65% of his pay. Buying could be cheaper, but banks are telling him he needs a year's worth of Canadian credit history. It just push you right back into renting. He's just happy to have found a place. Same for Isaac Wall. I'm thankful for everyone who has helped me in Canada. Even if the costs are making it hard. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winkler, Manitoba. And we'll continue to investigate why you're paying more for just about everything. We're calling our special coverage Priced Out. Watch for it on all of our CBC News platforms.
As I mentioned, this is the two-year anniversary of the official start of the global pandemic, a health emergency that one way or the other has affected every one of us. I hope that we don't forget the sacrifices that we had to make. Coming up, Canadians share their pandemic moments captured on phones and cameras over the last two years. And next, with mask mandates being dropped in many provinces, our doctors answer the questions on so many people's minds. Welcome back. Across Canada, COVID safety measures, including mask mandates, are in the process of being removed, with provincial governments saying the COVID risks are being reduced. But some health professionals have raised concerns. British Columbia ended its mask mandate for most indoor public spaces today and joining the other two western provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Next week, most mask requirements will end in Yukon, Manitoba, Newfoundland and Labrador and New Brunswick. Nova Scotia and Ontario will lift theirs on March 21st, and the rest of the country plans to do the same next month. We brought in two infectious disease specialists to talk about these changes. Dr. Isaac Bogosh is in Toronto, and Dr. Alex Wong is in Regina. And Dr. Bogosh, let's start with the Ontario perspective here. How do you feel about uh, where your province is headed? Oh, we're in such a better place right now than where we were one and two months ago. I mean, we certainly are seeing uh, this Omicron wave recede, but it's also fair to acknowledge that there's still a lot of Omicron still in the province. I mean, I think this is obviously a very contentious issue and people have very strong opinions on this. I, I, my take is that we should be watching this week by week. And, you know, there will be an appropriate time to lift mass mandates. I firmly believe that. But I would wait at least a few more weeks after the spring break to see how things go. You really want to see a sustained reduction in cases and a sustained, sustained reduction in hospitalizations before you start lifting these. I think we're seeing a bit of a plateau, maybe even a bump right now. And you really want to watch that come down a little bit more before you start to lift other public health measures. But I fully believe that we should lift it at some point. Dr. Wong, for better or worse, Saskatchewan, a leader in the country when it comes to making these changes. So you have lived in a province where there hasn't been a mass mandate for a, a few weeks now. Any sense of what the impact has been? You know, so like in Ontario, uh, you know, we've lagged a bit behind uh, Eastern Canada with regards to our wave. And so we've seen things come down uh, much more slowly compared to places like Ontario and Quebec. Um, our, our plateau certainly has happened and we're coming down. But that that uh, that curve uh, is not coming down as quickly as we would otherwise like. And that's probably at least to some degree because we removed all of our various measures and protections, you know, in February. That being said, we are definitely seeing hospitals and ICUs decompress. Uh, and, you know, uh, at this point in time, the mask mandate's been off for about two weeks. And so uh, we'll see basically how things progress over the next little bit. But we're not seeing an uptick as of yet uh, here in Saskatchewan. Dr. Wong, this is uh, the first day in British Columbia where the mask mandate has been lifted for most public spaces. And uh, I went into a supermarket. It felt kind of weird, you know, like people making the decision about whether to wear a mask or not. What's it been like in, in Saskatchewan? Have people been comfortable, uncomfortable with the changes? Yeah, so again, we've been a little bit different because uh, like Alberta, we kind of opened things up last summer. And so there was a period of time where there was no mask mandate. And again, what we saw was, you know, I think a gradual reduction in the number of people using masks. That's kind of what we've seen here. I think, you know, when I went to the grocery store about a week ago when the mask mandate was off, there were about maybe 60, 70 percent of people in the city wearing masks. And, you know, a couple of days ago when I went to the stores, maybe about 20, 30 percent. So, you know, that's kind of what we would expect to see. I think everybody needs to feel comfortable with whatever decision that they're making. I think the good news was was that, again, I mean, everybody was uh, comfortable, respectful, I think, with one another. And I, again, I mean, if you want to wear a mask, either because you want to help protect yourself, your loved ones, or to protect other people, I think that's absolutely something that should be encouraged and done. And obviously, on the other hand, if people choose not to wear masks, then, uh, you know, of course, that's their choice as well, and that should be respected uh, just as much. Let's talk about schools, and we went out and asked some parents in Toronto how they felt about all of this. I think it's a little premature, you know. I think I would like to see lower numbers. I don't love it, because I have young kids who are not eligible for vaccination, so I like the protection it offers. We're trying to keep each other safe, and I feel like this is one layer of protection, and by removing it, it's, it's too soon. I think that is a good idea, because nobody, know, I mean, nobody knows what is 
happening. A lot of people are still not getting vaccinated. I know both of you guys know both of these things. First of all, uh, you know, you, it can be a nerve wracking thing to be a parent and try to make the right decisions. And also there are fewer things more controversial when it comes to COVID than school policies. So I'm gonna ask both of you this, starting Dr. Bogosh with you. What advice do you have for parents? I mean, I, we are gonna see the lifting of mask mandates across the country. I think if uh, parents are concerned about uh, you know, vulnerable individuals at the home or they're concerned about their child, you certainly can continue to mask. Uh, and you know, obviously we've heard messaging from coast to coast talking about no shaming regardless of, uh, no stigma regardless of what decision people make. I think we'll still see lots of children going to school in masks either to protect that child or to protect people that that child goes home to. And that's totally okay. We're probably gonna see a lot of that. Dr. Wong, for parents who are watching, what would you say to them about their kids in school and, and masking? I completely agree with Isaac, Ian. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we're going to see a lot of kids going to school with masks on. And uh, obviously, there's going to be lots of kids who won't. Um, I think everyone has to make an individual level decision. Uh, for parents who are really uh, worried, I think if you have the ability to upgrade your kids' masks, to a respirator style mask or an N95 or something like this that is gonna provide better protection. Obviously remembering to have your kids fully vaccinated and boosted as you're able, I think will also help to optimize protection as well going forward. So we continue to encourage those things uh, as and recognizing that the masking piece is, is obviously gonna go across the country in the near future. And before we go, one more issue. I want to play a clip here from Toronto singer, Alex Pangman, who is immunocompromised. Uh, this is her reaction on masking. I feel horrified. Like this is, this is like implying that it's all over when in fact for immune suppressed people like myself, this is far from over. And it just, it just feels a little bit discriminatory. Nothing's going to change for me. I'm still going to have to be in my bubble. My quality of life will be impacted. My career, my ability to work will be impacted. I don't have a specific question, but I will go to each of you, uh, Dr. Bogosh, beginning with you. Um, given that some people are feeling a high level of anxiety, particularly if they're immunocompromised, maybe a last word uh, to each of you, starting with you, Dr. Bogosh. We have to approach this with empathy, right? There are many among us that, that are at greater risk of severe infection, and we should be taking steps to really protect everybody, including those vulnerable individuals. In the same breath, I mean, it's hard to reconcile, but COVID's not going anywhere. And this is gonna be here for a long, long time. We do have to find a way to move forward. And of course, we have to find a way to move forward with creating a safe environment as possible for all Canadians. Dr. Wong? I agree with Isaac. I think, uh, you know, for many people who are medically vulnerable, immunocompromised, who are anxious uh, about what these changes are all going to bring, I think, again, the individual uh, level steps that you can take in terms of optimizing your vaccine, whether that be three doses or four doses, whatever you're eligible for, in combination with a well-fit respirator, you know, no matter what everybody else around you is doing, that's pretty much going to help to keep you safe from pretty much any respiratory virus. So take comfort in that measure that you can take at an individual level for yourself. And again, at a societal level, we certainly need to be respectful of those at risk, those medically vulnerable as we kind of move forward, finding ways to do things safely and responsibly. Continues to change, but two years ago today, the pandemic was declared and here we are talking about COVID still. Thanks uh, very much to both of you. Have a good one. Take care. And this is an issue on the minds of many of us. And on Sunday's cross-country checkup, Dr. Wong will be answering your questions from masking to vaccine passports. The doctor is in for our Ask Me Anything segment on CBC Radio 1, CBC News Network, CBC Listen, and Facebook Live. We start at 4 p.m. Eastern time, live right across the country. A Canadian trapped in Ukraine reached out for help, and where he got it may surprise you. Everybody's on board, everybody's excited, everybody wants to help out. Coming up, the Winnipeg students who helped guide him to safety. But up next, the pandemic reflected through the pictures of Canadians. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. That statement would be a signal our world was going to change in ways we couldn't have imagined. Two years of sacrifice. 
long periods of isolation and public health measures, millions of cases of sickness and death, until finally the promise of vaccinations began to take hold. Our colleagues at Morning Live on CBC News Network asked viewers to share a picture that they took sometime over the last two years, the one image that embodies their pandemic experience. Of the hundreds of incredible submissions, here's a small sampling of what they received. In that photo, it's a summer day, and my sister's hugging my younger brother. I can't see her face, but I can see my brother's face, and I can just tell how much he missed her and how much it meant to him to be able to actually see her in person and, and just have that physical contact. I remember just at that time there was um, so much uncertainty about how things, how things, how long things were going to last and um, what the different impacts were. And so just that time was so precious um, to see each other. And we were all just uh, giddy and euphoric that day. I feel good when I look at the photo because it makes me think of just um, how important maintaining those connections were because we kept up with our visits no matter what, and um, we made sure we had a lot of fun with it. COVID was a huge um, wake-up call in terms of that the world can flip on a dime, and it does make you think about what your priorities are um, more and what matters to you. So the photo was uh, taken in the first summer of COVID. And I figured when we saw that sign, it was pretty much a perfect way to uh, capture the, uh, the essence of COVID with the two boys socially distant. I really liked that photo. We actually used it for a Christmas card that year as just sort of demonstrating to the family, uh, here's, uh, here's the boys uh, who were four at that time, I guess. Uh, demonstrating how they can be responsible and, and take care of everybody around them just by doing something that simple. But when I look ahead, let's say 10 years into the future and, and try to imagine, you know, how we're going to remember this, this photo, I hope that we don't forget the sacrifices that we had to make uh, to keep people healthy, to keep ourselves healthy and our family. We're going to see that photo and it's going to be uh, something that uh, really carried the spirit of what COVID was all about in terms of trying to keep each other safe. In 2020, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and was going through chemo. In the photo, um, my sister had sent me a parcel for my birthday and it included a beautiful ladybug handbag and a hot pink mask because she knew I was going to the hospital quite often for chemo treatments. It was like getting a big hug from her. Even though I hadn't seen her in quite a while and I couldn't have a hug, it felt like she was hugging me. I mean, it was scary going into the hospitals by myself. I couldn't have my husband with me, but I, I handled it with a lot of humor and, um, and not too much swearing. What goes through my mind when I look back at that photo? Just how uncertain everything was with COVID, with cancer, not being able to see my family, not being able to uh, connect with anybody. Yeah, just not having that support uh, that's so important when you're going through cancer. What I'm hoping people will get out of when they see that photo is that it doesn't matter how tough things can seem, that there is always a brighter day ahead. A perfect note to end on. The war in Ukraine has created a shortage of grain exports, but that could be an opportunity for Canadian farmers. You will know in the next week or two whether that's going to bring new customers to the table. Coming up, what Canada could do to fill the gap. And coming up this Sunday on The National, Andrew's interview with Toronto filmmaker Domi Shi, who's breaking new ground with her new Pixar film, Turning Red. It doesn't hit you over the head with its 
Asian-ness. Like, it's not about being Chinese. Yeah. It is just part of the backdrop. Yeah. As we're seeing all of these movies coming out, we're redefining what universal stories look like and who gets to tell them. This story is, is not specifically about a girl being Chinese, but like, it's, uh, it's telling this universal story about a girl just struggling with bodily changes, with her mom, with growing up. Andrew's full conversation with Domi Shi, Sandra Oh, and other members of the cast of Turning Red, it airs this Sunday on The National. A variety of factors that already put people around the world at risk of food insecurity, climate change, inflation, the pandemic, and now the so-called breadbasket of Europe has been hit hard by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They are two of the world's biggest producers of wheat. One third of the global market is affected. Karen Pauls now on whether Canada can help fill that gap. So, so we are right now in the Asian noodle line. Potential customers come here to Cereals Canada to learn how to use Canadian wheat in the products they make. We get to actually uh, taste products from around the world because we claim that in this bakery, we've probably made any bread that is commercially baked around the world. With the war in Ukraine creating an expected shortage of wheat worldwide, Dean Diaz expects to have more interest from both existing and new clients. We will know in the next week or two whether that's going to bring new customers to the table. Canadian farmers already produce about 12% of the world's wheat, but Diaz says there's a limit to how much they can ramp up their production. We have enough supply to supply high quality end users, but we don't have a global demand to fill every wheat requirement around the world. On his family farm, Doug Martin is getting his machinery ready for spring planting. At the same time, keeping his eye on the news and commodity prices, the price of wheat has already increased 50%. Yeah, well, it's the highest uh, I think wheat's ever been, so it's, uh, it's incredible. Martin will benefit from those prices on the wheat he had already planned to grow, but it's too late now to add more acres. Most farmers uh, do not adjust what they grow uh, from year to year. They have set crop rotations. On the flip side, farmers are also affected by the sanctions against Russia, which are creating higher costs on everything from transportation to fertilizer. Before the invasion, fertilizers were already quite expensive. Uh, the night of the invasion, fertilizer prices jumped like $200 US overnight. Back on the farm, Doug Martin says spring is always an optimistic time for farmers, but he doesn't think there will be many winners in what he describes as a horrific situation. Karen Pauls, CBC News, near Selkirk, Manitoba. When we come back, a class project with a real world outcome. They really took over and um, mapped out a safer route for him. How a group of Winnipeg students helped a man flee Ukraine safely. A wave of humanity continues to flee Ukraine. Millions are on the move, and for many, getting out of the country is not only difficult, it's dangerous. That was certainly the case for one man, so Gary Milani contacted his daughter for help. She's an education assistant in Winnipeg, and what she organized is our moment. Oh, it's so good to hear your voice, honestly. It's so good to hear your voice. <laughs> that was the big payoff for Karen Robb's inspired plan to get her father to safety. I was thinking, you know, kids, students know the most about technology these days. So she put together her team of young analysts. There's some live satellite images that they have, and I use that to spot him at the city hostel. We know he's at that location. So they really took over and um, mapped out a safer route for him. Using satellite imagery, Google Maps and social media, the students helped Gary Milani navigate rubble and shelling to make it to the train station in Kyiv. He's now safe in Poland. We did something, and that's, I think, the best part about the whole story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. A story with a very happy ending. And the progy making and everything. <laughs>
And a story that is symbolic of so many things that uh, about the ties between Canada and Ukraine. You know, you see in that story, family ties for sure. The fact that people want to do something. Also the technology that, that uh, the internet has remained robust in Ukraine. And also you can, from a classroom in Canada, help somebody find their way out of Ukraine at such a great distance. That is The National for March the 11th. Good night.